Well, I guess this is a pretty good time to, to welcome you to Ag Inside the Beltway. It's a new year, new administration, changes and challenges as well. I'm Tony St. James. I'm with All Ag All Day and allagnews.com. We cover ag all across the country. Our headquarters are actually in Texas, but uh, we have affiliates that we send programming to from California to New York. So thanks for uh, tuning in. We'll just step through quickly uh, where we've been, where we are now, where we're going, and then uh, I'll throw in some uh, key takeaways maybe and uh, some random thoughts along the way. Uh, what I share with you is not really my own personal opinion at this point. Uh, I don't think I'm that smart, but I do ask a lot of questions and I spend a lot of time in interviews with people who are pretty smart. So I'll try to share some of their insight as well as we move through this. So uh, let's get started. Where have we been? And uh, it, it is kind of interesting. I stuck this in my pocket earlier today. Uh, the National Cotton Council on Thursday came out with their planting intentions uh, number for 2021, and it's 5% fewer acres of cotton uh, in the U.S. And I just wrote down some numbers. Uh, over the last 10 years, the National Cotton Council has hit about 60% of the time they've, they've been a little high, 40% of the time a little low, uh, but they're usually within less than 10% accuracy on their report. And they're saying 11.5 million acres. So we'll pick that up here in a moment uh, because what's happening with cotton acres might be affected by what's happening with some other acres as well. So where have we been? A new paradigm of prices. As we look at corn, it really traded below $2 prior to 1973. And then as we hit 1996, we saw $4 corn. And then in 2008, $6 corn. And then as we uh, rolled into 2012, we saw $8 corn. And that was really spurred by a few things, but I think you can point back to the biofuels revolution uh, of 15, 20 years ago that really started pushing the price of our, our grains and oil seeds higher. We saw the same thing with beans. They traded below $4 before 1973. And uh, if you remember 1973, well, that was quite a volatile year because beans did move above $10 during that year as well. Now, since 2007, we've really stayed above $10 with beans coming down below that from time to time. But again, strengthen the soybean complex from biofuels as well. Uh, and cotton. Cotton is one of those that really has not seen one of those benefactors like uh, the biofuel crops have uh, for cotton trading 89 cents back in 1973. And as I click over to where we are today, uh, on Thursday, the 11th December cotton future settled at 83.78, still below where it was in 1973. So cotton producers have, have really been dealing with a little more challenge uh, than maybe some of our grain and oil seed producers. We did see $2 corn back in 2011. And what we found when you see prices like that, suddenly it starts taking out people. One of the biggest merchants in the cotton world for years had been uh, Donovan Enterprises. Billy Donovan Jr. would speak uh, in front of that National Cotton Council annual meeting each year and give his outlook for what he saw coming for the cotton industry. Well, what happened in 2011 with $2 cotton took merchants out, took a lot of uh, players out because they couldn't make those margin calls. 
So there is a downside to seeing really high prices along the way. I don't want to spend all of our time on prices, but I think it's important to look back at where we've been with that. 2011, 2012, the Southwest moved into a, a disastrous drought that uh, not just uh, did we see the land parched, but we saw a major sell-off of cattle uh, across Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and Colorado and New Mexico and back over into the West uh, through Arizona as well as that that uh, devastating drought rolled in. It affected livestock producers, it affected row crop producers, and it was really the beginning of what we would term the, the last depression that ag has, has suffered through. Uh, so drought and depression were a couple of things. Then we had the trade issues as well. Uh, World Trade Organization's only been around for about 25 years, but in that 25 years, it's made its mark on U.S. ag. And I'll look at cotton again, a uh, Brazilian challenge of the U.S. cotton program leading up to the 2002 Farm Bill. Congress had to change the way the cotton program was put together because of that Brazilian World Trade Organization challenge. So uh, suddenly the, the trade uh, plane was changing on the U.S., and so that's where we've been. Obviously, we had uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, and then we had China that was starting to grow up, and everybody wanted to be friends with China. Where are we now, though? Well, we've seen markets recover. We've just come through a long, dry spell for producers uh, where we've we've seen net farm income falling. Uh, that happened through the Obama administration and, and through the Trump administration as well. It's only been since a few months back that we saw prices starting to recover and markets starting to recover. And had it not been for the help that Congress and USDA uh, passed on through the market facilitation program and through the uh, CFAP payments, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, CFAP 1 and CFAP 2. Had that not come into ag, we would have lost quite a few players, not for the high prices, but for the very low prices and not having a, a market to, to sell to. So Congress you, uh, and USDA, I think you really have to take your hat off to them because they noticed this and reacted quickly to help prop up the ag industry until the markets recovered. And part of the markets recovering was the resumption of trade. We mentioned China earlier. Uh, that Chinese trade war actually started, what was that, four years ago? with sorghum as suddenly they made an announcement during commodity classic that they were basically going to throw a pretty steep tax on u.s sorghum the number one buyer of u.s sorghum is china so obviously that was the first salvo if you will in that trade war and it just spiraled downhill from there as we basically played chicken with uh, one of the world's biggest economies and our, our biggest, not just competitor, but our biggest customer as well. And so then we worked our way through that trade war to come out with a phase one trade agreement. Chinese have not met the expectations yet. I think you still have to point back to where we've been with the coronavirus uh, to see that that probably slowed some of the purchases. But as of late, Chinese purchases of corn, record purchases of corn. They continue to buy soybeans. They're back to buying cotton. And they're the number one and really the main buyer of U.S. sorghum as well. So we've seen trade resuming. Also, uh, some other agreements that have been renegotiated as well, like with South Korea with Japan. And speaking of those trade agreements, 
uh, prior to January 20th, the U.S. trade representative was working on trade agreements with the United Kingdom, Kingdom after Brexit and also with Kenya. And if the new administration can bring that one across with Kenya, that sets the stage for uh, one of the largest areas of growth in the next 20 years, which will be the continent of Africa. And we're on the precipice of change. And, and I threw that in because the administration has changed. And within the first 20 days, uh, a lot of change coming uh, from the pen of President Biden. So where are we going? Climate change. Bet there isn't a day that you uh, have not heard climate change uh, mentioned at least a half dozen times. And you're going to continue to hear that. And I think sometimes we look at that and say things are getting um, somewhat radical, if you will. I, I don't really think that's the case at all. I think what you saw with the Trump administration was trying to roll back and take out all of the, the regulations that they possibly could. Uh, had the Trump administration not been there, it could have been either party, we probably would have just seen a slow move towards climate change legislation already. That's been coming for years now. It just took a break for four years. So you're going to hear a lot about it. It may seem like it's coming quickly, but just remember you had about a four-year break in there. Attacks on modern ag, we're already seeing that, and we've been seeing that for now 10 years. You'll continue to see that from uh, government organizations, uh, non-government organizations, and from businesses uh, and industries trying to take advantage of, if you will, degrading what farmers and ranchers in the U.S. do. And I, I think that's going to be a, a key factor to continue to watch. And it works right into the final point here, which is misinformation. Uh, you probably see or hear it every day. I was in with a national press club uh, briefing, I believe yesterday, as they were talking about food insecurity. And suddenly, somehow, food insecurity turned into how damaging the livestock industry is to our climate. Not using accurate uh, information. By the way, if you'd like accurate information, uh, some of the best is, is from a researcher at UC Davis, Frank Mitloner. Uh, and if you don't follow Frank on Twitter or are unable to find some of his information, just Google him. Uh, he's, his Twitter handle is GHG Guru, Greenhouse Gas Guru. Uh, Frank Mitloner, he's, he's probably the... Uh, the top expert when it comes to uh, animal feeding and the climate. Very good information through Frank. But there's a lot of misinformation out there, and, and Frank spends a lot of time trying to correct this misinformation. So just some uh, key thoughts to take you through. I mentioned may seem like we're dealing with some radical changes right now, but remember, uh, if you would have not had the last four years, a lot of this would have just been coming slowly. There is a, an old story, I don't know who, who to credit it with, uh, but they talk about a preacher who'd gone in on a brand new preacher to a church on a Sunday morning, and the pulpit was on the left-hand side of the stage, and he wanted it in the middle, so he moved it to the middle, and the next Sunday he was fired. Well, about a year later, he goes back to the church and he sees the pulpit in the middle of the stage. And he goes up to the preacher and says, what in the world happened? The preacher said, well, I wanted to move it to the middle. The preacher that had been fired said, I tried that and I got fired. Well, he said, well, I moved it about six inches every week and that's where it is now. And I, I think sometimes we, we look at the radical change and forget that 
it, it's not moving overnight. It was a slow move to get to where we are today. Again, the last four years probably uh, insulated us from some of that. Federal debt, that's a huge one. Uh, right now, I'm watching uh, Ways and Means hearing. They're talking about more aid for Americans. But it's an underlying issue is how are we going to pay for this? How do we continue to borrow money? And we have no way to pay for this. Uh, we also have heard that throughout the week uh, through the Senate Budget Committee as they've had their White House uh, economic advisor uh, nominee in front of them. And they're asking the same question. It's coming from both sides. The federal debt is a huge issue. We've got to figure out how we're going to solve that. Uh, the last one here is relationships. And, and I just throw this out there because uh, we're starting the process of writing the next farm bill right now. That's beginning right now. Well, when it comes to the farm bill, the largest portion of that farm bill is nutrition. And the reason nutrition is part of that farm bill is because uh, 20, 25 years ago, People like Larry Combest and Charlie Stenholm uh, from the House Ag Committee figured out they needed allies and they needed to build a coalition. And so they found members who don't normally care about what's happening in a farm bill, and they found a way to build a coalition where they could all work together to pass a farm bill. There are downsides to that, obviously. But I think it's a good and gentle reminder that agriculture better find good allies and coalitions, even with maybe people you don't normally deal with on a, on a daily basis. We're seeing the National Cattlemen's Beef Association already doing that. Uh, the Public Lands Council doing that as well, signing some memorandums of understanding and finding ways to agree with groups you don't normally agree with, but finding common ground and starting to work together because when you've got an ally, you can do a whole lot more. I just want to point out a couple of things here. You've got, um, when I say a tax, it's not necessarily a tax, but Senate Ag Committee, a new member there, is from New Jersey. And that's Cory Booker, who has authored some legislation in the past to get rid of uh, commodity checkoffs. So things are going to get interesting and relationships will definitely be important. Uh, just a couple of other little random thoughts. I mentioned Twitter earlier. Um, it's just been a few weeks back that we've seen people banned by Twitter. And I think it's a good and Again, gentle reminder, if you live by Twitter, you can die by Twitter as well. Uh, so I hope that that's not where you get all of your information from because uh, it's important to, to find different sources, find sources that you don't normally agree. Try to be well-rounded as you're getting the information uh, to make your decisions. Uh, again, uh, I've stepped back from Twitter a little bit uh, simply because maybe the fire was getting a little too warm, but I, I'm, I truly believe if you live by Twitter, you could also die by Twitter. Facebook reminds me of the, the National Enquirer you used to pick up at the grocery stores you were checking out. It's the modern day version, in my opinion, of the National Enquirer. I actually had a cousin who had uh, posted something on Facebook years ago about McDonald's serving humans uh, and were grinding up people in their burgers. And ironically, I had just been to the headquarters of McDonald's in Chicago and gone through one of their plants where they actually produce the quarter pound burgers, saw it firsthand. Uh, so there's some strange stuff out there on Facebook. And what's even scarier is I think there are people who believe that media have they lost their marbles? Probably. 
I'm part of the media and I'm pretty sure I lost my marbles years ago. Uh, we've heard about the attacks on the media as of, you know, the last year, a couple of years or so. It's important to remember the attacks on the media didn't just start over the last four years. Uh, just do a quick search on attack media 2013 and see where that takes you. Uh, it's, it's not something that just happened overnight, but too often the media uh, listens to the squeaky wheel and they'll follow that and they'll get sucked into it. I want to offer this to you. If you meet somebody who doesn't know what you do in ag or uh, somebody in the media, one of the best things you can do is help them know what questions to ask. It's a simple thing because sometimes they'll come up and say, which cow gives me the chocolate milk? Well, it's silly if you're in the dairy industry or you're in ag and, or even if you're not, and you know that uh, there's not a cow that gives you chocolate milk and there's not one that gives you almond milk either. Sometimes they're silly questions, but try not to roll your eyes. Make sure that you, you address it, but then provide them with some good questions. Well, here's some good questions for you to ask. I think if ag will do a better job of helping people ask the right questions, not giving them all the information, just help them ask the right questions. It'll put us on a, a path to help educate people on what really happens. And speaking of education, there are still a lot of good people working for you in DC right now, whether elected or staff members or working for, um, for the federal government or for commodity groups, farm groups, ag groups. There are good people and their hearts in the right place. Uh, unfortunately, they're being pulled in a lot of different directions. Be patient with them. Help them know the right questions to ask. Uh, you know, I think of, uh, of Representative Costa uh, from the dairy industry, and he'll let you know he's from the dairy industry. He knows the right questions to ask already, but there are others who don't. So help them, help them to know what questions to ask, maybe not telling them all the information, but give them Give them the ability to ask the right questions and they'll find the right answers. So there you go. It's kind of a run through uh, what's happening in Washington, D.C., where we are, where we're going, where we've been. And, and I hope that, uh, hope that you've been able to pick up uh, some good information here today. Again, none of this is, is really uh, my opinion. Okay, some of it was my opinion, but... Uh, really where we're going, there are some really smart people out there, and I, I just challenge you to find them within the uh, ag media. Ag media does a really good job of covering things, so I'll challenge you to find them. So there you go. That's our, uh, that's our presentation today. So glad you were here to join us. Not sure if there's any questions. Uh, if there is, I'll, I'll hang around for a couple of minutes. I might not have any good answers, but uh, I'll be here if you need it. You can also reach me uh, via email at Tony at ParamountBroadcasting.com, or you can just go to AllAgNews.com. That's AllAgNews.com, uh, and you'll find an email there. I'm on Twitter at all ag all day all ag all day pretty easy to remember as well i want to thank uh world ag expo for the opportunity uh also uh, uh pam sweeten and and her group who uh, always do a great job of putting together some great programs and and the sponsors that have made it available as well there you go thanks <music>